Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest all the way from Southern California, from Lake Forest, very close to Laguna Beach. Welcome to the show, Gene Trowbridge. Thank you, Victor. Happy to be here. Well, great to have you here, Gene. Now, you are a specialist. You've been at this this game a long time, a securities lawyer and a, a true expert. You and I have known each other for close to a decade, and I'm thrilled to have you on the show. In fact, I'm surprised you haven't been on the show before now. I talked to so many real estate investors that are trying to get started in real estate investing, and I see them doing things that are not compliant with at least my knowledge of securities regulations. Why don't we start from the very beginning and just talk about the different types of securities that are out there, the the types of things that are, let's say, the, the rookie mistakes that you see people making all the time? I think the biggest rookie mistake is people think that they can put together a group of investors and call it a JV and end up without having it be a security. And uh, that's a major mistake because a JV really isn't a, an entity of any kind. It's just some, some language. And so when they, they try to do that, they have one LLC or two LLCs or five investors, and they just call it a joint venture. But the securities laws takes over whenever some one person is in charge of the money. Whenever we have some passive investors, if you would, and we have an active investor, the rule says a security is an investment of money in a common enterprise where there's an expectation of profit, but it's all going to happen through the results of the promoter or the sponsor. So the minute you have that promoter or sponsor, uh, you've got a security. It could be one investor. Victor, you could put up 95% of the money and I could put up five, but you give me all the authority that's a security. You could put up 95 and I'll put up five and, and you would say, my voting rights are 95% gene and yours are five. Well, you just created a security right there. To get away from that, we'd have to have equal, equal voting rights so that you're not in charge of my money. Is it simply a matter of voting rights or is it actual day-to-day decision-making that makes it a joint venture? Well, more than likely, it's the major decisions, because you know you can always just hire a property manager to do the day-to-day. Of so course. I could give you those day-to-day decisions, but if the major decisions were uh, totally in your, in your ballgame, then, then we'd have a security. And then I think the other thing that people make a mistake on is advertising. What can they say to people? The inexperienced syndicator doesn't know the difference between a non-advertised security offering and an advertised securities offering. 506B, 506C, which you're aware of, uh, that's that's an issue I have all the time. Uh, I'm pleased you started there because I think there's a lot of people out there, like you said, that think they can circumvent securities regulations by simply calling something a joint venture without it being a true joint venture in fact, and it's really the substantive facts underneath what you call it that that rule the day rather than what you call it. That's true. The name isn't anything. You have to look at the agreement. And and really, once again, if there's there's someone who's in charge of your money, a long time ago, the government decided they had a vested interest in protecting you. And so they wrote securities laws to protect the people who all of a sudden lost control of their money. So a friend of mine, I think you and I both know him, uh, speaks very eloquently about this and defines three different types of securities. There's the registered securities that are, for example, shares of IBM that are publicly Mm -hmm. traded. There's exempt securities, and then there's illegal securities. (laughs) Yeah, I've I've had that conversation myself. Yes, you know, the, the securities laws say that every security has to be registered with the SEC unless it's exempt. And so what's an exempt security? Well, generally in the marketplace today, it's some security that is written or offered under Regulation D. In uh, 2021, the dollar amount of Regulation D offerings in the United States, which we call private placements, which are exempt from full registration, was 
over $2 trillion, Victor. And 96% was 506B and 4% was 506C. So that's where the money's raised. There's actually more money raised in the private placement, non-registered securities, than there is new money on Wall Street each year. And that dollar amount went up about $200 billion each year we were in COVID, which I thought was interesting. Wow, that's stunning. So the interesting thing about these exempt regulations is it doesn't exempt you from following the rules. It only exempts you from registration. That's right. It, it exempts you from the rules that apply when you register a security, which might go to having annual audits and things like that. But you have to follow the rules of Regulation D, and there are six specific rules in Regulation D. Without naming them out, I'll just name some of the concepts. There's a rule on accredited investors. There's a rule on sophisticated investors. There's a rule on advertising. There's a rule on having to have a PPM. There's a rule on having to file a Form D. And those are the type of rules that you have to follow. And all in all, the number one rule, even though it's not written, is that the sponsor is responsible for giving the investor all the pertinent facts before the investor invests so the investor can make an informed decision. So the number one rule in my business is disclosure. As an experienced syndicator myself, uh, I obviously echo everything that you've said so far. In your experience, the, the marketplace has changed. It used to be the case that a lot of these offering memorandums were put together in a fairly custom manner. And today they're increasingly more and more template-based, I think leading people to believe that they don't actually even need Securities Council. How has the role of a securities lawyer changed over the years? Because uh, you're not getting paid by the word, I'm sure. You're getting paid to put together something that's going to comply with the rules. Sure. Well, we work on a flat fee based on the dollar amount that's raised. And there's no question there are chunks of the document that are the same the uh, dispute resolution, the liquidity provision, those are probably the same as you look at, at the documents, maybe not the same as mine and the same as what your attorney does, but all mine are the same. But I've been in court a couple of times where the boilerplate PPM has been presented to the judge. They weren't jury trials, they were judge trials. And the judge's comment was, you know, you can't tell this PPM from another one. You can't tell what the property is. You can't, you can't tell. And in each of those cases, the sponsor lost. So the responsibility is to write a PPM that will explain to the investor, will disclose to the investor <laughs> everything that they need to know to make an informed decision. I don't think our role has changed. I see a lot of stuff online where people can download private placements and and documents. And I guess if I had gone to the third mistake that I see people making is using a canned presentation. The offering memorandum, the company agreement, that's a piece of legal work. And that would be the unauthorized practice of law if you did that. Can, can you talk a little bit about the merits you mentioned two different offering types. There's the 506B, which allows for both accredited and non-accredited investors, and 506C, which is accredited only, but also offers with it the possibility of advertising the offering more broadly, where non-solicitation is an absolute requirement of the 506B. You mentioned that the marketplace seems to be heavily weighted towards the 506B offering. Do you have, do you have any other thoughts on the merits of one offering type versus the other? I think the reason 506B is the most popular is that if you are going to take accredited investors in, all they have to do is check the box and self-verify that they're accredited. And then you can take people that aren't accredited. And there are a lot of people in syndicating for a long time with great databases. They already have a pre-existing relationship. They don't need to find new investors. My, my most prolific client, Victor, has done 
100 offerings with me since uh, uh, 2014, and they're all between a million dollars. And he does 506B all the time. Only accredited investor. They just check the box. He doesn't need new investors. So that that's why I think. Uh, plus, the broker dealer community, the stockbrokers, is where most of that two trillion dollars is raised, and they all have databases, rolodexes, if you would, and they have a previous relationship with all their investors. So they're not advertising for new investors for this offering. Five hundred six C. The problem is, you're going to have to get each investor to opt into some third-party verification that they're accredited and experienced investors with you won't want to do that. So it's a burden. Very interesting. Well, Gene, if folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? Well, the best way would be um, to reach out to me via email, gene, G-E-N-E, at Trowbridge Law Group dot com or just call me you can call my direct line 949-855-8399 949-855-8399 and i'm in southern california pacific standard time i'm up early because victor everything's east coast for me so <laughs> i'm up early and uh, and work late so they can always reach me this was fun thank you Fabulous. Well, Gene, love the perspective, love the education. For the listeners at home, definitely connect with Gene Trowbridge at trowbridgelawgroup.com. The link will be in the show notes. And in the meantime, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.